Kari Polani Levit is, uh, as you all know, of course, the daughter of Karl Polani, the Hungarian Canadian political economist um, and the author of The Great Transformation. Um, his work, particularly this book, has loomed large recently in various lectures here at the uh, John F. Kennedy Institute and at the Graduate School, in part because of Nancy Fraser's, um, Nancy Fraser directs the Einstein uh, Research Group, and she has recently been doing some work on the crisis and transformation, which she has shared um, here in this very room, um, and also as a fellow at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. So, um, we have a lot of speakers here, and usually my introduction goes rather quick, you know, got her degree here and her PhD there and published a great book, but in this case you'll have to indulge me slightly longer because Kari Polani was born in 1923. I'll let you do the math. It's been a long, um, productive life, and uh, you need to have at least a little bit of background um, on who she is and what she's done, other than um, that she had the opportunity to discuss with her father all the time about his thoughts and his ideas while they were forming. Um, and she will not talk about her own past, so I'll just give you um, a little bit of background. She was born in 23 in Vienna and um, has become an economics professor uh, in her own right. Uh, she taught economics at McGill University in Montreal um, until 92. We'll get to that because um, at first there were some detours. Um, she had to flee Vienna um, at the age of 13, I forget exactly. Right? When did you leave Vienna? When you were 13? When I was 10. 10, at the age of 10. Um, and she went to London to um, be with um, friends there. And um, eventually she attended the London School of Economics from 42 to 47, interrupted by two years of national war service with the research department of the Amalgamated Engineering Union. In 46, she worked on what became a historic study of the effects of Allied strategic bombing on the German war economy. And she came to the same conclusion as a much larger and longer American study on the same question directed by John Kenneth Galbraith. The conclusion being, of course, that aerial bombardment of um, industrial cities in Germany had the effect of increasing German war production and not decreasing it. In any case, she moved to Toronto in 47 um, because she had met, who was then later to become her husband, a Canadian whom she married in 1950, the historian Joseph Levitt. And her parents then also came to Canada, um, even though Karl Polanyi had um, already gotten um, a teaching job at Columbia University. But his wife, who had been a communist, um, because of McCarthyite laws, was not, they were not allowed to settle in the United States. So he worked and taught at, in New York and uh, vacations. Um, and the rest of the life was spent near Toronto. Um, back to Kari. After first doing research and writing for a trade union newspaper in, in Canada, she returned to graduate school in 57 at the University of Toronto, where she got her MA in economics in 59, and then she was hired at the Department of Economics at McGill in 61, before she had even completed her dissertation. 
In spite of a big teaching load, which junior faculty know this fate everywhere around the world, she had that um, as well, but in spite of that, she managed to direct a major research project at Statistics Canada, constructing input-output tables for the Atlantic provinces of Canada. When the New Democratic Party of Canada or when she was asked to, for, the, for this party to um, develop a position paper, a sort of a background paper on foreign ownership, on the effects of foreign direct investment of multinational corporations, um, this paper eventually <clears throat> developed into her book, Silent Surrender, The Multinational Corporation in Canada. Um, which was published in 1970, and where she argued that um, U.S. ownership of Canadian industry would result in um, national disintegration and the loss of sovereignty. Got reprinted many times, um, like many famous books, uh, was initially rejected by the publisher as unprofessional and sloppy. I was reminded of uh, David Harvey's famous book, which was initially rejected also. Um, <clears throat> it was reissued in 2001. It was translated into French, um, and many of you, of course, may be aware of it. Also, in 1960, she directed at the Center for Development Area Studies, a project on externally propelled growth and industrialization in the Caribbean. And in the 70s, she managed to take uh, various leaves of absence from McGill to work for the government of Trinidad on a system of national accounts. And uh, she also had appointments at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and in Jamaica as a visiting professor. So development studies was really her own area of, of research and, and expertise. And when she came back from Jamaica in 1980, she, um, it wasn't until then that she began to deal with the legacy of her father's um, writings. And, in doing so, she worked towards a centennial conference celebrating the life and work of Karl Polanyi, which took place in 86. In the following year, Concordia University um, established a Karl Polanyi Institute of Political Economy to which Kari Levitt made the Polanyi archive available. And since then, there have been biannual conferences, international Polanyi conferences, taking place not only in Montreal, but also in Mexico City and Budapest and Istanbul, um, bringing together critical political economists from around the world. I participated in a couple um, which were extremely interesting. After retiring from McGill in um, 92, where she, as I said, specialized in development eco economics, especially with regard to Latin America, to Latin American economic history and economic development. She went back to the University of the West Indies in Jamaica to work there from 92 to 97 and to, and to write her book, Reclaiming Development, Independent Thought and Caribbean Community, published in 2005. Also in 2005, the director of the Polanyi Institute at Concordia, Margie Mondel, published a wonderful book highlighting Kari Levitt's work, together with that of Gregory Baum, who also had to flee Berlin. He was born, he's German, and had to flee Berlin when he was 17 in 1940 and <clears throat> was interned in Quebec uh, in a refugee camp, later to become a famous 
theology and sociology professor. So this book uh, about both of them called Reclaiming Democracy, Social Justice in the Political Economy of Gregory Baum and Kari Levitt, um, I can recommend highly to you. In any case, she has continued to be active, um, taking her own analysis and the insights of her father to deal now with the crisis, the 2008 crisis and its reverberations. Um, and this is today's topic, uh, of course, a comparison of the great transformation with the neoliberal counter-revolution, which facilitated the great financialization. The floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, first, let me express my thanks, my um, really my gratitude at being invited to the Karl um, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation to deliver this lecture and the extraordinary circumstance that it falls on May 8th because probably there, there may be scarcely a person in this room to whom May 8th still has any significance. But anybody that is even vaguely as old as I am will remember it as the day that the war ended. It was VE Day in London, Victory in Europe Day. It was the definitive and final end of the Nazi regime. It was the end of the Second World War in Europe. And for those of us um, who were living in London throughout that um, war, it was a day of enormous, unbelievable celebration in which quite rivers and rivers of people came from the four corners of London to descend on the center. Um, can you hear me? It's, yes. Um, of the city, uh, and on every corner or every second corner there were bonfires, people pulling the wreckage of the bombing uh, and making bonfires, pulling old people out of houses where these old folks haven't been out in the open air for years. And for the first time, of course, there was light after five years, four years of blackout. And, you know, a reference was made to that famous study on the effects of Allied bomb bombing on the German war industry. And the fact you cannot put a people down just by force. And exactly the same effect was in Britain. And the effects of the German bombing of Britain was exactly the same, that people worked longer hours uh, and everybody uh, did uh, something when it so to speak, the country required that to be done. But you know, this is a year of many other anniversaries, um, particularly, of course, because we're speaking here about the work of my father, Karl Polanyi. It is 70 years since the publication of The Great Transformation in 1944, which, always, which has been paired for good reason with the publication by Friedrich von Hayek of a book by the name of um, The Road to Serfdom. And I will come back to this pairing of uh, Polanyi and uh, Hayek uh, in, in uh, very, very uh, shortly. But of course, then there is even the bigger anniversary and I've been somehow thinking that because it is 2014, it is the 100 years, the century since the beginning of the First World War. Uh, no, I was not alive yet for the First World War. <laughs> I am very old. <laughs> I was born in 1923, as was explained, but the First World War was not one of my memories. <laughs> but nevertheless... I am very much aware that the First World War was very important to me because it 
it was uh, the occasion at which my mother met my father, or my father met my mother and when they met, and I will tell you a little about that because it's really uh, important and germane to this uh, talk. When I um, look, think of the history, the history of the 20th century, but even I would say the whole history of industrial capitalism from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the First World War stands out as a watershed event, as a really extremely important event which transformed the landscape of Europe. Um, kaisers and czars and sultans and kings bit the dust. It was uh, really... Uh, there were wonderful posters of the time when you actually see them in caricature, kind of being f chased off the throne and falling, literally falling into the, into the dust bin of history, if you wish. Um, the Russian Revolution, 1917, which was a world-shaking event and put an enormous fear into the, the proper dead classes of, um, all over Europe. But I come to the to the uh, to the war because it was so so important in the lives of my two parents, and let me start with my mother because my mother, if I were a believer, I would think my mother was now smiling down upon me here at the podium of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation because my mother was. At the age of 20 years old, she, yes, at the age of 20, she carried from um, Switzerland, there was a group, an important group, including Lenin and his entourage uh, from Russia and others who were gathered, who were opponents of the war, of the First World War. And they had um, a conference in a village by the name of Zimmerwald, and there is a declaration which was made, and it is known as the Mabal Declaration. I know my mother, who was at that time studying engineering in Zurich, and had met uh, these, uh, these very interesting, exotic, amazing people, these foreign revolutionaries she had met, she had liked, she, they had formed a friendship. So they gave her a mission to carry this um, appeal uh, called the Zimmerwald Declaration uh, to go and find some, some leaders of the Socialist uh, Party in uh, Vienna uh, and um, transmit it and thereby uh, hopefully produce an uprising in Vienna that would put a stop to the war. So, so that was the plan. Well, she was <laughs> very, she was, I think, all of 18 or 19 years old very pleased to be uh, given this task to do. And when she presented herself in Vienna to these gentlemen, I think they took one look at her and told her, go home, child, right? <laughs> Just go home. So she, she, however, decided that she was going to act on this matter, and she was going to go on to Budapest. Um, she was, uh, my mother was Hungarian, I should explain, although she was born in Vienna. And in Budapest, she went to consult uh, with um, Erwin Sabo. He was um, a, a leading um, anarchist, and he was the head of the public library. And he was very radical and very much opposed to the war. And uh, he gave her some counsel and some advice. I, don't, I wish I had time here to tell you more the remarkable stories. But the fact is that this young woman... Not only did she distribute leaflets to the um, war factories and the barracks, but she actually conceived the idea. She found the other young people. She wrote the leaflets. She organized how they should be printed. Uh, and a group of young people did indeed engage in this anti-war activity, for which eventually they were caught and uh, put in jail and put on in trial for treason. It was not a small matter. She and um, her partner at the time, 
I think he was uh, very briefly her husband um, before she met my father. Uh, and, and there was this trial of this very beautiful uh, young woman coming from a very good family, let's say, uh, the, the upper classes, uh, and, uh, and the scandal that she had uh, done this, scandal as far as her class uh, family was concerned. So that was my mother, and a very independent person all her life. And, when, and then eventually she became a founding member of the Hungarian Communist Party. And from what I gather, they were all very, very young, a lot of young people. Um, she went to Moscow, she worked there for a little while, and then she returned to uh, Vienna. And in Vienna, by this time, there was a very large number of political refugees who came from Hungary after the defeat not only of the Republic, but then of the nine months of a communist, um, whatever it was called, of the council, revolution of the councils. And when that was put down, and the rather right-wing government came to office, there was a huge exodus out of Budapest. My mother left, and, and it included also my father. My, my father, who had been an officer, uh, at the front, the Russian front, in the most very, very difficult, terrible conditions, had contracted typhus, was very ill, had been brought back to a hospital in Budapest. And um, when he was at the front, he took with him one book. One book? It was not the Bible. It was the collected works of Shakespeare in English. And... Uh, Later, he wrote um, something about Hamlet, a kind of a very interesting and, in a way, autobiographical essay. But the fact is that, that during this time in the war, my, my father had, perhaps you might say, a kind of a personal crisis and a sense of personal responsibility for the disasters for the killing, for the war, for the um, collapse, as he wrote in his book, of the civilization that collapsed in 1914. Um, and uh, he had been, incidentally, an organizer of the um, student movement, founder and first president of the Hungarian student movement before the war. And then my father and my mother met, and it is important for me because I would not be here if that had not been the case. But before we, uh, we leave the stories to move on, I, I have to put on the record, and this is really why I think my mother would be so pleased that I am here today, is that my mother was expelled from the Communist Party of Hungary, which had only recently, probably only founded in, in, in 1917 or 18 or something, for Luxembourgist deviations. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, for my mother, who was at that time a 20-year-old, she must have looked up to Rosa Luxemburg, really, as, as a very important and senior um, figure in the movement because there's a whole generation of uh, age b um, between them. But she published uh, something in a, in a journal that was edited by someone by the name of Paul Levy. And uh, he also, I think, had his differences or was thrown out or walked out, I'm not sure. And I may say that this was not the first time my mother was thrown out of a communist party. And she also managed to get herself thrown out of the uh, Austrian Social Democratic Party at some point in the 1920s. She was a very independent woman. <laughs> and my father adored her. My father, let me go a little bit into the family history because it is important in understanding the world of thought and the philosophy of Karl Polanyi to understand where, where he came from. And uh, 
<laughs> sorry, <laughs> I got distracted. Um, he, um, my, my um, father, the father of that family, first of all, their name was not Polanyi. Their name originally was Polacek. It was a Jewish family uh, from uh, northern Hungary. Um, the family consisted of my, my father, his younger brother Michael. Michael Polanyi is also very no well-known, became a very well-known scientist and philosopher. Um, his sister Laura um, and another sister Sophie, there were six children all together. Uh, the father was um, a railway entrepreneur, had studied mechanical engineering in Zurich, um, and uh, put the, f the income of this bourgeois family, originally it was in um, Vienna. The family originally was in Vienna. Now this is quite important because uh, the, my grandfather, the father of Karl Polanyi, married a uh, apparently very beautiful Russian girl of Jewish origin, who was my grandmother. And she had been sent by her father from, from um, Vilnius, Vilna, Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, to Vienna, um, apparently to get her out of trouble maybe, to, to learn a trade so she would not get mixed up with student revolutionaries and, and so forth. And she had been sent to Vienna um, along with a family friend who came from Simferopol, I think that's in the Crimea, it's been in the news recently. Uh, and this friend of hers married uh, a, a, somebody in Vienna, I'm sorry, it's a little bit complicated, a gentleman by the name of Klatschko. And this Mr. Klatschko, who had also come from Wiltnusch, so this is a whole family, uh, relationships in Vienna um, where was a had attempted to form a commune in the United States named for a certain Chayana uh, uh, sorry, named for a Tchaikovsky, not the musician but another Tchaikovsky where well, that had failed, he had come back and he had become a refuge for Russian revolutionaries in the late 19th century of all, of all kinds. And it seems that my father and his cousin, Ervin Sabo, the same Ervin Sabo whom I mentioned as being the librarian in Budapest uh, and an anarchist, they were cousins, uh, and they saw um, how the family was looking after these Russian uh, revolutionaries that had come. Uh, my father told me these stories of how they were uh, wet and cold and they had their feet tied up in newspapers and many didn't have shoes. And so they were cared for uh, as a sort of rest and recuperation uh, at, in the home of the, of, uh, of the family. And very famous personalities uh, of the, uh, uh, from Russia who passed uh, through the bookshop which Mr. Klatschko had uh, in uh, Vienna, including Trotsky and a number of other well-known names of uh, that era and earlier era. So my father writes how he admired, how he admired these people for their courage, these revolutionaries, who were in the conditions of Tsarist Russia at the time, uh, conducting basically assassinations of Tsarist officials. That's more or less what was happening. But, um, and they would most certainly be called terrorists today. But they, my father admired them and so did his, his family uh, for their courage, for the individual courage. And um, that also goes for the great figure of Bakunin, which also my father admired very much and thought that he had not been treated um, fairly 
or properly uh, by uh, the Marxists uh, of his uh, day. So uh, all of this is because there was a great deal of idealism uh, in the early growing up years of uh, my father and I think his siblings. Um, this, I think, takes us in part to the importance in revolutions of the past of students and student movement because my father admired very much the Russian students and the student movements and when he uh, was instrumental in, in, um, in uh, initiating a student movement in Hungary that was called for Galileo. It was called the Galileo Circle. Um, he said that it was the, the model it was based on were Russian students. And I started to think that, you know, wherever and throughout history, the importance that students have played in revolutions. Um, or in at least um, signaling the discontent of a society. Um, now wait a moment. I've got, I'm, I don't have very much time. I know that I have very quickly to uh, move uh, forward. Uh, in Vienna, my father was a, worked as a journalist. Uh, he worked as a journalist um, specializing in international affairs for an economic, um, financial economic weekly that was um, some based, uh, something like the London Economist would be today. Um, and in that capacity, he followed the events of the interwar period um, very closely. In... Um, Oh, yes. I was going to come back to Vienna in the 1920s. I was going to come back to talking about Hayek and Karl Polanyi, who published books in 1944, uh, which in a, in a way representing, I would say today, uh, two philosophies, two ideologies, uh, which are completely um, opposed. The circumstances at that time were that Austria had um, been reduced to a very small country, an empire of 50 million, the great Habsburg Empire had been dismembered, had been uh, formed into a whole number of uh, new states, um, all of them quite weak, um, all of them dependent on finance and loans, including Austria itself, which then had only a population of six million, and the huge capital of Vienna of uh, two million, uh, and had uh, from, the, from 1918 on a socialist majority in Vienna, from 1918 until 1934. Uh, and um, the, my father, and uh, very much admired the achievements of the uh, Vienna Municipal Socialist Municipal Administration. Uh, the, in terms of the social housing that was built, but uh, more than that, in terms of the cultural um, upliftment of the population. I, I, I don't have very much time, and I could, I could talk to you for many, many hours, but I don't have many hours, and that's a problem. Um, on the other hand, um, oh yes, the, the um, financing of, these, of this very, um, uh, extensive program of uh, of housing, and let me say the houses were bright and modern and designed. Some of them designed by leading architects of uh, famous uh, name. Was financed largely by taxing uh, private residential apartment houses, and um, 
so the the bourgeoisie, if you like, of the city, or those people who owned private residential apartment houses and properties were not very pleased. Uh, and uh, the the, the uh, people who have become famous in, in, uh, in the school of Austrian economists, um, the most important of which was a character by the name of Lud Ludwig von Mises, uh, were really uh, very much opposed to everything that was being done in socialist red Vienna. Um, they were particularly frightened by some of the language which was used. And the language could be quite frightening, even if it didn't mean what it said. You know, words like dictatorship of the proletariat, that was very frightening, uh, and frightened them. But I may say that Mr. Mises, and I did find that out, I did quite a lot of research uh, on him, um, and some, and you will find that in in the uh, one of the chapters of this book. But I have a, a new book here in the collection, and one of the chapters deals uh, with Hayek and Mises and Vienna at that time. Um, is recalling a demonstration in Vienna before the First World War. It was a demonstration. I I can't remember the date. Maybe it was. Uh, it was uh, 1910 or 1908, um, I don't know the date, but it was well before the war. And uh, it was a demonstration of what appeared to have been about 200,000 workers coming on the Ringstrasse in formation like uh, right across the street, and then more and more and more people. And they were demonstrating in front of the parliament, and they were demonstrating for the vote. They did not have the suffrage demonstrating for the vote. And Mises saw that and he described that it was utterly terrifying. Absolutely terrifying to see that these unwashed masses uh, should actually get the vote. So, um, the Mises had a very famous um, seminar. At that time, he did not have a university position. He worked, uh, he was employed in the Chamber of uh, Commerce. Um, and his uh, protege, Hayek, uh, similarly, um, was employed in the Chamber of Commerce. And he had, um, he published an article early in 1920s. And the article was to prove that it was impossible to have any kind of socialist economy. It was not possible to build a socialist economy because you need a functioning price system uh, um, whereby prices are established by supply and demand. Uh, and it, so in any event, um, there the, the then followed a correspondence and there were a number of um, others who participated, including my father and suggesting that really this was not really so. There were, uh, there, there were other ways of arranging this. I don't want, if, if we have a question period, I'll tell you more about that. It is very important. I have also described it in this book. If I can persuade you, if you are sufficiently interested in the ideas of Karl Polanyi, uh, it, I would strongly suggest that you read the um, chapters two and three, if nothing else, because that is where um, where I explain that Karl Polanyi, in those discussions on an ideal socialist economy. I remember that there was no country yet that ever had constructed a socialist economy. There were no countries that were socialist in the early 1920s, and uh, not the young uh, Soviet Union either. They were engaged in a, in a civil war. Um, he was 
opposed at that time. He said, I, I cannot accept either the Social Democratic Party's position, which I'm not quite sure what they were at the time, but the Social Democratic Parties of Austria and Germany, uh, as I recollect it as a child, because I belong to these children's organizations of these parties, believed that somehow when uh, they get a parliamentary majority, uh, by uh, some kind of magic, they will uh, create a socialist economy. Um, he did not believe that. Uh, but he was not in favor of the kind of centralized, uh, what we call command economy, that was constructed later in the Soviet Union with the five-year plans. So he was uh, interested in, in thinking of how it is possible uh, to have an economy uh, that is efficient and reasonable, works efficiently in terms of allocating resources, uh, but uh, that at the same time is democratic in the sense that it represents the interests of the workers, um, of the enterprises, of the consumers, and the citizen. The idea being that, look, one person, one individual, is at the same time um, a consumer and a citizen and possibly a worker or a small business person, or maybe he, he might be... Um, an owner at the same time. So how can we build a society in which the interests of, uh, are represented organizationally? So this, this is not the individualistic um, model of individuals, um, individuals participating in the market for goods or in the labor market uh, as um, on the supply side of the labor market or the demand side of the goods market, etc. But rather, it was a model of um, associations, uh, associations and organizations, associations of uh, neighbors, of citizens, of, um, of workers, of uh, businesses, of professions, um, at the local and regional, maybe national level, and really of negotiation. Negotiation uh, in a way which would reflect, because a negotiation implies that, let us say, it is workers negotiating they would have to decide among themselves and negotiate within themselves as to what is their negotiating position. So there would be a very real input of decision-making uh, of, of people in such a society uh, in their various capacities as producers, as consumers, as citizens, um, and as, uh, as artists, as musicians, or whatever, whatever. <laughs> So this is, I know sounds a little bit vague, but it is an approach, at least in terms of the underlying philosophy of it, that, that has, uh, in my opinion, a considerable resonance with the kind of uh, world that a lot of young people would like to see today. I am talking at perhaps in terms of the student strike that I witnessed in Montreal, where I live, in two years ago, um, where there was a remarkable level of organization of the students in a very, uh, they very deliberately wished not to have big, um, big feature leaders. They wished to organize, they say, horizontally in a way uh, that uh, there would be spokesmen, but there would not be um, identifiable 
um, leaders know. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, this talk was uh, advertised from the great transformation to the great tra financialization, and I haven't yet managed to even broach the subject. I don't know how we're doing for time. Um, <laughs> the, the fact is that, very briefly speaking, my position on this crisis is that what started as a financial crisis in 2008 was, from the beginning, something different and something more than just another bubble. It was a very big bubble big real estate bubble in Europe, it was uh, absurd. There was a time when uh, GDP per capita in Ireland or in uh, Portugal appeared to be higher than that in uh, Britain, but that was all a um, fi financial bubble. But my position is that there is, um, that the crisis actually revealed a, um, a relative, I call it a relative decline of the capitalist heartlands of the West, including Europe um, and North America, um, and uh, a shift, a shift um, in uh, international economic relations of power, uh, toward um, from the west to the east and from the north to the south, if you wish, and this was really revealed by the um, by the crisis, whose impact was extremely severe on Europe and uh, North America, um, more severe than was at first admitted. The figures were forever being revised uh, downward. Uh, on the other hand. Uh, the um, Asia, Latin America, and even Africa um, recovered very uh, rapidly, and more importantly, showed a, um, an energy, a dynamic of economic growth, particularly in what is called developing Asia, which comprises over half the population of the world, that is all of Asia without Japan or South Korea, um, of between 8 and 9 percent per annum averaged over 10 years, the first decade of the new millennium. That is simply a massive explosion, if you wish, of economic activity. I have no illusion what, what, is me what economic growth measures, um, but there is no doubt that we have a, we are entering into a phase and, uh, of, um, of the capitalist uh, system, if you like, uh, that, is, um, that, that presents some enormous challenges. I like to talk of, of it in terms of three, maybe three or four dimensions of challenge. One has to do with the fact that the um, has to do with the degeneration of the political system. It has to do with the capture of governments by finance. It has to do with the fact that for the last 20 years already, um, governments have responded more rapidly to the bond market and what it has to say than to opinion polls or elections. That political parties, we have formal democracy, but political parties contesting power increasingly resemble each other. Where there are two main parties, they are increasingly not really very different in their policies. And more than that, the policies remarkably approximate the requirements of the corporate world, such as economic growth over environmental concerns, um, investment, favorable investment, climate over concern 
uh, on social programs, uh, reduction of uh, government expenditure, re uh, reduction of public sector deficits, etc. Where both parties basically agree um, on on that. Um, in uh, Europe, we have a very serious situation, which you are well aware of, that the countries of peripheral Europe, of the Mediterranean, really have no effective democracy, in the sense that they have no effective economic sovereignty. Uh, the, the elections really are a choice that people have as to who is going to implement the um, the orders, the conditions that accompany the financial assistance coming from Brussels or wherever. Um, that is why I say the problem is more intractable in a way than the crisis of the 30s. In the 30s, the governments were not as powerless as they are, seem to be today, vis-a-vis -vis the financial sector. Um, and the reason for that is that for 60 years or so, large banks have not been allowed to fail. That was never so before. The banks used to fail. In fact, in the American crisis of the 1930s, 10,000 banks failed within a week, and they were just let, they were permitted to fail. To fail. The next, but that is not the only problem. There is a a problem, as I see it, that the um, increasing international competition, which we know as economic globalization, uh, liberalization um, of trade, but of financial movements also, have has speeded up, has has uh, created a stronger competition. All countries participating in international trade and more countries have been forced to be more open to international trade. Um, exports and success in exports has been made a major objective of national policies. And the result of all of that, as I see it, is to speed up the the pressure toward the reduction of unit cost of everything uh, and speed up the rate at which technology is replacing labor, not only in the richer countries, but also in, in, uh, in much of the rest of the world. Now, there is a particularly disturbing report that was, um, came out of Oxford, I think it was reported in The Economist, where they claim that within 20 years, I don't know if it was in England only or if it was on a world scale, uh, but they said within 20 years, 49% of the jobs existing will not exist anymore. It'd be a very, very large reduction in, in employment of the kind which we know. Uh, you have to combine this with the information which we have known now for a long time, but has recently received a lot more prominence of the rapidity with which income uh, distribution is piling up the gains of growth at the top, at the 10% or the 1% or the point. 0.1% uh, of the population. Uh, and that has, has uh, reached, um, and it is uh, due, it all really started in 1980 from the liberalization, and it's very clear that the kind of, th that the freer, they say freer the market is from regulation, uh, the more uh, it produces polarization and inequality. So the combination of increasingly unequal uh, the proceeds from economic growth and activity together with the reduction in employment um, for the masses of people 
spells a major social problem ahead. I, I find that this is a particularly paradoxical because what is happening in a way is that people who are in the workforce work harder and longer than they used to. Many, some people work two or three jobs at the same time. Um, people who are employed are afraid of losing that employment uh, and increasingly have, if it's white collar work, uh, are uh, in effect in a position of having less time to themselves, uh, being more accessible by email or by texting and by all kind of electronic um, communication. So you have this paradox of people working hard at the same time. It seems that um, automation and robots are able to displace uh, labor at an increasing uh, uh, rate. Well, uh, the logical situation might be that we should, uh, we should welcome this and there is uh, a lot less work to do and perhaps everybody could uh, work only three days a week. Uh, but at the same time, this is uh, the way our uh, system is organized. Uh, this is going to be very difficult uh, to, to achieve. It is going to be in contradiction, really, to the way the capitalist system is organized. So then we have an ecological crisis we, we know about, the, um, uh, of climate change. Without going into detail, what we can say about that is that, um, that basically not very much is being done about it. So, uh, ten more minutes. Ten more minutes. Oh, thank you so much. I thought you were going to say one more, two more minutes. So, what I'm, what I, I guess, what I'm saying is going back to my father's work. Question, why is it that this book, particularly The Great Transformation, that was written 70 years ago by somebody who is virtually unknown, who never had a position in any university and, until he was 61 years old, and then it was a, only temporary one year and another year. How come that this book has... has um, has not only survived, but has been increasingly valued as saying something that people can understand, can relate to, uh, and particularly so in the more recent years since the crisis. And what is it that he is saying in this book? Well, it, seem, it seems to me, if you just strip it down most simply, what is being said is that we are socialized into an economy which increasingly forces us to live and to behave in order to survive in a way which is really which 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 is really denying us the freedom to live in the way that we really might like to live. Uh, and it is, it is de now destroying, well, whereas we managed, I think, rather well on the whole, and I'm talking about, uh, we are speak talking now about the, um, capitalist centers of the world, Europe, North America, in those 30 years from the end of the war until about the mid-70s or from the 80s. But this, um, what has happened since the 1980s, is so-called neoliberal counter-revolution of freeing markets, has created a situation of this um, extraordinary inequality um, very rapid technological progress, um, problems in the labor market and uh, un unemployment, um, 
a reluctance to face uh, the ec ecological uh, problems that we have to face. And perhaps it is to me most clear, because my field really is that in developing countries, that, that what is presented to us uh, as uh, free enterprise and democracy is really, um, when we look at it more closely, a very, a rather sophisticated structure of um, international uh, agreements, free trade agreements, um, which protect the economy and protect the major actors, particularly the companies, the corporations, and the banks, from um, measures which might be taken by governments uh, to get them to, to behave uh, more how we would like them to behave. Uh, and this is something, when coming back uh, to Hayek, I just want to round it back uh, to this interesting period uh, uh, in Vienna in the 1920s, uh, wh when um, Hayek and his associates developed this philosophy, this idea that really made out of economics some kind of a... Um, an ideology that the free market is miraculous because it represents the opinion of millions and millions of people, but it is, in the end, that same market that has become a threat to uh, societies, to nature, to the kind of way we would like to live, and there is that paradox hanging over it. How come that technology that promises uh, us uh, relief from drudgery uh, is proving to be uh, such a negative thing that is threatening people's livelihood. So I'll stop there and hope you will ask me some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, also, what a rich story and what an inspiration to hear of Karl Polanyi's life story that he wrote his masterwork over the age of 50. And for, for those of us drifting into middle age without permanent academic things with perpetual postdoctrine, that's uh, a great story. Uh, gives me hope. The, um, the big question that's been on everybody's lips since around 2008 would be, would there be a double movement in response to the great crisis of 2008? And it seemed like everyone would interpret this crisis through one or other great Austrian political economists. So the neo schumpeterians were imagining the crash of 2008 would lead to the great sixth Kondratiev wave, that maybe it would be a, a green Kondratiev wave, and perhaps the Polanyian uh, tendency of that was perhaps looking for the Green New Deal, which would be this re-socialization around ecology, a new ecological social democracy, which would respond to the crisis of neoliberalism. However, what is it, five years now after the crash? Neoliberalism is intensifying, so is fossil fuel extraction. Can capitalism at all save itself? Is, is it beyond its bounds now to have a protective double movement? Maybe that moment of state-organized capital, of the, the zenith of the 20th century, is long gone. That is quite possible. Uh, no, no, the, I, I, I thank you for the question. The double movement, the, the context in which my father, as I, as I read it, mentioned the double movement had to do basically with the history of Britain. And it had to do with, um, with measures that were taken 
to limit hours of work, um, various labor legislation, trade unions, and so forth. It was in the political space of one nation, right? I, I have um, always wondered myself whether this double movement, uh, in the way in which he described it, uh, could operate other than within uh, the political boundaries of one particular um, country. Um, more than that, if some people would interpret the double movement in the sense of, well, you know, you, you in, in the sense of the 30 glorious years of the uh, historic compromise and Keynesianism, etc., 45 to 75, followed by, you know, 30 years of a free market, and uh, there's some kind of a wave going i i don't see any uh, i i don't i don't think this makes any sense it sounds very nice i don't i i, I don't think so um and i think the whole concept of the double movement is perhaps the the most questionable part of the concepts introduced by Karl Polanyi. That is just my own opinion. But, but what remains of it, I think, is important. And what remains of it is that there is that the, the, the market, I hate this phrase, the market, because it really has very little to do with market anymore. It is a very complicated, sophisticated arrangement of different kinds of monopolies and monopsonies and, uh, and uh, rentier uh, incomes of uh, properties and titles to property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it does bear down on societies. And perhaps it is clearest seen when they are small developing countries, because then it is, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, take El Salvador, right? And uh, So there was a mine. It's a small country. It's densely populated. Uh, and the movement arises to say, we will not have any mining in this country. And this is supported by the Catholic Church. Right? So I see that as a counter movement. Uh, but but here you're dealing with a, a finite community in a, of a small country called El Salvador. I don't know how that can operate on a global scale. So I I think some people have a lot of illusions about this double movement idea. But don't misunderstand me. I do believe that it is necessary to. Um, take measures to prevent the destruction of societies, communities, and, and the natural habitat by the market. Um, so I uh, would see this more as a counter movement that is, in a sense, going to move, perhaps slowly, toward decommodification, towards pushing back, particularly on, the interna on international trade and international markets, uh, certainly pushing back on these agreements that give foreign investors rights over domestic uh, companies, the uh, bilateral investment treatments and the corresponding um, mechanisms for dispute settlement. They are simply grossly um, aggressive. But there are, let me tell you, 2,000 or 2,500 of these agreements in force. So you have a whole huge network, uh, call it a straitjacket, a new golden straitjacket of a network of agreements. And all this has started more or less since the early 90s. Um, now, what is a counter movement, perhaps, to roll these back, to ignore them? <laughs> But I think your pessimistic thoughts uh, are um, serious. <laughs> we do have it currently against the TTIP. People the trans are Trans-Pacific. Exactly. Partnership. Well, both um, the Trans-Pacific, but, but also have. here in um, there's um, a lot of civil society groups organizing across Europe. Um, 
right now because the EU is, you know, succumbing. Well, I'm very happy to hear that, but I mean, it is to me appalling that the European Union could be even negotiating this thing. <laughs> well, you have how many states here? And these states and these governments and these parliaments have not been consulted. And the thing goes on, I'm very happy to hear there's some counter-movement. But this is a real, really, a real menace. And they, they have one with Canada, in Canada. Same problem. The clauses are secret. Uh, yes, there are people, civil society makes noise. But, but the, that things have reached, that's why I say I don't think that European nations have sovereignty anymore with respect to the European Union or the bank. And in, in that, I'd, I'd, I'd like, if, if, if I may, you know, I found somewhere four points that my father had set out, four points. Uh, and of the, of a, in respect to, you know, the international system. And I think the first one was in that he would favor pluralist, pluralistic democratic solutions. Pluralistic is important. Secondly, that national sovereignty has to be protected against imperialist domination by stronger powers. Thirdly, that uh, technology, that we cannot escape modern technology and we should not try to do so. And finally, I guess it's a point that goes back to Keynes, Keynes's ideas regarding the desirability of an international system of trade and finance that permits countries and regions uh, to have a great, greater amount of autonomy and difference uh, control over what he would call their foreign economic policy. And that's exactly what we don't have. And what these agreements attempt to do is to, is to fit impose one model on the whole world. And I hope we have a great movement to roll it back.